A um, little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Sujit. Work at Elsevier Labs. Um, all right. Good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, so um, my role is a data scientist role, um, mostly self-taught. Um, uh, prior to this, I was doing search and natural language processing, and over the last few years, I've been doing some uh, machine learning and deep learning as well. Um, I got interested in nerds um, about sometime last fall when I was doing some work in relation with search and knowledge graph uh, development. So I wanted to build some custom named entities, and this seemed to be a nice thing to do. Uh, disclaimer, I am not neither the author nor one of the original maintainers of nerds. Uh, this was built by my colleague, uh, Panagiotis, from my Amsterdam office. Um, there's a bunch of contributors, and my name isn't there either. Um, they're all from the Amsterdam office and from the same group. Um, this was open source like a year and a half ago. And uh, uh, one thing I would like to say, though, I'm not just a happy user. Um, I picked it up, and I've made some changes to it. And they're all in my fork. And I think my changes uh, are actually you know. I'm hoping to fold them in around January, February next year. Um, and you'll find that uh, I have more functionality in my fork than the original one. So that's something I wanted to just mention. So um, the agenda here is uh, I've broken it up into five little sections. So let's go. OK. So uh, why, why would you even care about any year? I guess some of you might actually care because you do it as part of your day job, but for the rest of you. It's basically a foundational task for any NLP pipeline, just like part of speech tagging, phrase chunking, you know, even uh, sentence splitting and so on, right? Um, there are a good uh, name entity recognizers available, um, you know, uh, trained entity recognizers that are able to detect uh, standard name entities like people, places, things, or, or organizations and stuff. Uh, but really, I'm looking for custom NERs, right? The things that I can build myself. Um, NERs are also, uh, so the out named entities, the availability of named entities is also uh, useful for downstream tasks, like maybe topic modeling, core reference resolution, and so forth. Uh, for myself, uh, I found NEs uh, useful in uh, information retrieval um, to chunk your queries into meaningful um, pieces, and also to understand query intent. Um, I'll not go into depth. I actually built a system totally based on NEs and which understood query, you know, used query intent. Um, the other thing that uh, you actually uh, need to do is uh, if you're doing uh, knowledge graph constructions, so typically a knowledge graph is a bunch of triples, like subject, predicate, and object. And the subject and object are basically entities. So again, you need entities to, you know, get the subject and object before you can do relation extraction. So that's another, um, you know, kind of thing. And if you combine the two, uh, you get the holy grail of search, concept search or semantic search, right? So, so these are probably the reasons why uh, you would care, right? Um, I'm going to go through a, you know, kind of a whirlwind tour of uh, NER techniques. Uh, for those of you who are not, um, um, you know, uh, who are not doing NER uh, for a living as I'm doing right now for a while. Um, typically, NER techniques are, you know, they go from the traditional to the neural. Traditional are like rules or regular expressions. Rules could be things like finding uh, names, proper nouns. And you say, OK, you know, the rule is that uh, those words must begin with a capital letter. Um, regular expressions could be things like looking for dates and times, different uh, kinds of formats. Uh, gazetteers are basically just dictionaries of terms. And um, the idea is that you have this dictionary, and uh, your text, you find uh, instances of these uh, terms in your text, right? And uh, it's kind of old school, but don't knock it. It's very, very useful, right? Um, for statistical, for those of you who come from the search side, you are looking for basically uh, things like you're looking for um, sequences of words whose empirical probabilities are higher than if you multiplied the probabilities of the individual words together, right? So if you multiply the probabilities, it means they're independent, Right? So that, that's why you're saying that the probability of the three things together, you know, occurring together is uh, very low. But if the empirical probability is higher, then that's an entity. It's not a named entity, but it's some entity of interest. Right? Um, there's also sequence models, of which the most popular one is conditional random fields, which we will talk about um, slightly later. On the neural side of things, there is the bidirectional LSTM, um, which is the basic uh, 
a building block of um, um, NER and as well as you know a lot of other things like even part of speech tagging, for instance. Um, but most real um, neural models for NER also include a CRF head. Uh, CRF is the conditional random fields. And of course, uh, since the beginning of this year, there has been uh, a bunch of transformer-based models. So the ones here in uh, orange are the ones that NERD supports out of the box. So we'll, uh, I'll uh, talk, to, talk about that later a little bit more. Uh, one other thing I wanted to bring up, again, for those of you, I apologize to those of you who are already into NER and know all these things, um, is the standard uh, data format that we use. It's called uh, BIO tagging. Uh, BIO stands for begin, in, or out. So if you look at the example up there, so you find that there are the, whatever tagger that is, the hypothetical tagger, has actually found um, two entities in there, Barack Obama and the United States, right? So in the BIO tagging, you would uh, basically tag Barack or Barack Obama as beginning of person and Obama as in person. And similarly with United and States, and every other uh, token is termed as out. So it's not in um, the NER uh, sequence. There is a variant uh, called BILOU, where BI and O are the same. U stands for unit for single tokens, and uh, L stands for last. So in this case, Barack Obama would be Barack B per, and Obama would be uh, L per, right? So in the BILOU system. The other thing I wanted to point out is the Cornell format. Um, it's based on the Connell uh, shared task, where you basically represent your data, the, the tag data, as basically a two-column vertical format, right? So the first column is the token, the second column is the tag, and it's tab separated. And at the end of each uh, sentence, you have an empty line to mark the end of a uh, sentence. So the reason I bring this up is because that is the standard format I'm going to have nerds use, right? So. Um, for gazetteers, that's the first one we are talking about, you know, the traditional setup. Um, usually, most gazetteers in the market today use uh, the aho Korasik algorithm. Uh, the aho Korasik algorithm was uh, first published in 1975, still being used. Um, essentially, all it is, it, uh, you take your dictionary and you create the data structure like that, right? And then, you, essentially, you stream your content one pass, single pass against the, uh, this uh, data structure. And as you stream, uh, it will, you know, think of it as hitting the, o, the zero uh, node, and it will try to find tokens that it can navigate to. And at the end of, so if you look at that, the Barack Obama, it just navigates down to Barack and Obama, and then at the end of it, it cannot navigate any further, so it comes back here. It reports that I found a pair, and it comes back here, right? And back to the zero node. So uh, the, the nice thing about this is it's like a single pass algorithm. You don't have, you know, regardless of the size of the dictionary, you only do a single pass against the data, right? Um, the second one is uh, conditional random fields. Um, essentially, the, the easiest way to think of conditional random fields is it's a sequence version of logistic regression, right? So if you have these tokens, you can find features for each of these tokens, and you can independently predict the tag for each of the tokens, right? in normal logistic regression. Now consider that you can also look at the previous label, the next label, the entire sentence, you know, any other token entire sentence, and so essentially the entire sequence is available to you, right? And you can basically uh, create a labeling over, you know, this L, right, of uh, tags over the entire sentence, the best label. And how you do it is basically you create these features, right, the feature is a function of um, the sentence, the current position, previous tag, next tag, and you weight them, and you basically sum them up for each token. And then for the entire sentence, you sum up this set of um, um, you know, token um, scores, and then you learn the, the weights here, because you did a set of weighted features for each token, and you learn these weights using gradient descent, right? So that's typically the approach. And uh, this is actually, for those of you who have done HMM and have struggled with it and you know, concluded that CRF must be even more tough, it's not true. That was me. Right? I used to think that, but this is like totally, uh, you know. So in any case, um, um, neural models, uh, the simplest thing is uh, by LSTM. 
um, it's basically two uh, recurrent neural networks um, pointing at, you know, going to opposite direction, one reading front to back and the other reading back to front. And of course, um, in neural networks, it's not just uh, words going in. You essentially, uh, you create embeddings out of these, right? So it's a vector. And then on the other side, it's actually a, a vector of probabilities of which the probability of B power is the highest, right? So that's how you, so it's kind of an abstraction here. Um, oh, the nice thing about it is uh, unlike CRF, where you actually have to do manual feature engineering, um, there, are, uh, there is no manual featuring engineering here. You just uh, trade compute and uh, data for the extra uh, manual work, right? Uh, again, like I mentioned, uh, real world um, NERs uh, have this uh, CRF uh, layer on the head, right? Uh, this, this CRF head on top. And essentially everything is the same except for this additional CRF head. And uh, the CRF that, uh, uh, the, the features that the CRF consumes is basically the hidden states that come out of each of these uh, uh, neural networks, right? The, the RNNs that sit there. And, oh, the other thing that uh, I read here, um, that pre-trained embeddings. So essentially, you can either learn the embeddings from scratch, right? So you start with random vectors, and as you train, it uh, basically figures out the embeddings. Or you could pre-populate for each word, you could look up something like word to vec and find, say, you know, what is the embedding for Barack, right? And you put it in there. And then over time, it modifies that. So that's what this means. Pre-trained embeddings observed, are observed to improve the performance. So something to keep in mind if you're actually building something like this. Um, so the next step um, from the word embedding, so we talked about this, right? So this is basically consuming words and um, creating embeddings and, um, uh, you know, we, it's basically creating the, uh, uh, predicting the tags, right? So the next step here was uh, basically to expose the signal in the characters itself. Why? Because there might be some characters, if you're looking up embeddings, words, um, then there might be some words which may not be in your um, embedding dictionary, right? So, and the other thing is that there is signal in the word structure itself. So if you have words which end with ly, for instance, or uh, even words that end with uh, pre or sa, right? So those mean something, right? Prepone, right? Postpone, that sort of thing. Um, so it explores the signal. So essentially what it does, it takes a word, right, like united, decomposes it into a sequence of characters, and then uses a neural network to basically pr you know, extract a vector out of this, right? And the word vector that you got from this one and the character vector that you got from this one are then concatenated and then sent to the BioLSTM uh, CRF head, right? So it's like an additional thing that, so again, all weights are learned end to end and this is, uh, an, so in, in nerds you will find the neural network um, um, model. It can optionally take the character LSTM. The other thing you can think of is that uh, this is mainly useful for things like uh, word 2 vec and GLUB, the older uh, type of embeddings. If you think of uh, things like subwords embeddings like fast text, um, it, that actually contains a lot of the information that this guy is going to talk about because it contains subword embeddings, right? Again, something to keep in mind. Um, so, so the next step is to basically replace the word embedding, the static word embeddings that you got with contextual word embeddings, right? So, um, there is a model in NERDS which uses ELMO. Uh, so essentially you pass the entire sentence to ELMO and ELMO will give you back a sequence of words. So if you think of a word like bank, for instance, right? So bank could be a river bank, bank could be a place where you put money. Um, in case of GLOVE and word to vec the embedding return is exactly the same, right? However, depending on the sense in, in which you use the word bank, the embeddings in, out of ELMO or any other contextual embedding uh, system would be different, right? So, so this is again another little improvement uh, to go forward with. And finally, of course, we have uh, BERT um, and, and its variants, definitely. So there are two ways to use BERT. One way is basically to replace uh, this component with a BERT component, right? So that's the easiest, uh, simple way. The other way to think about it is that BERT itself is a language model that has been trained with large amounts of text, and it has learned how to learn the structure of sentences. It has learned how to, you know, uh, figure out what sentence or what word is what sense and so forth, right? So 
if you then fine tune this, uh, this language model, the BERT language model, with your own data, which is basically uh, words and tokens and tags, right? You could come up with um, a model that is uh, uh, basically a named entity extraction uh, tool, right? Um, this is not there in Nerds yet, but uh, I'm working on it, and it's coming soon. Like you know, so it's maybe January or so. Yeah. Uh, no, so that was that was this one, right? So if you extract, if you just replace this Elmo component with a BERT component, it would basically just extract BERT pre-trained BERT vectors, right? But you're feeding those vectors into, into a CRF. Uh, yes, vectors. yes. But on the BERT side, on the BERT side, the, all this is uh, built in. So essentially, you are saying that here is my uh, language model. There is no CRF. It's like a sequence to sequence model, right? Except that, you know, it's not like context. It's everything comes into, you know, it's like parallel, right? It's an end to end uh, kind of model. Yeah, my question was, uh, what's going to be the uh, algorithm that you'll be feeding this data in? OK, so um, essentially what I'm uh, doing here is that I'm fine tuning this model. Right? This model is already a language model. It knows how to you know, uh, work with English. Right? Let's say it's English. Um, I now fine tune it to take in tokens and return these tags. So slightly different uh, task, but it's still leveraging the structure of the sentence. Right? So that's. Um, so I haven't done this yet, uh, you know, but this is in the works. So, you know, like, this will come most likely in January, February time frame it should be there. Uh, here is some more information. Um, I like this uh, this high-level overview. It's a series of blog posts. Uh, the rest of it is basically survey papers, slightly old, um, but it has a lot of coverage. So you know, just um, is there. And I will share the slides, so you don't have to actually take pictures if you don't, you know if you don't have to. Um, so back to nerds, right? What the architecture is. So according to nerds' own uh, readme.md file. Um, it's a framework that produces easy to use NER capabilities to data scientists, right? And how it does that is it basically wraps uh, popular third party NER models. It doesn't have to. You could write your own NER models and call them through nerds. Um, and again, so new third party tools can be either, um, you know, your own or third party NER tools can be added. And I think of it less as a data science thing. Than more, you know, and more of a software engineering thing, right? So it basically makes, simplifies data science tasks uh, for um, people who are doing NER, right? And um, basically, I'm here because, uh, you know, if you guys uh, download it, use it, like it, give us stars, that way, you know, we get support. And it's easier for us to basically tell management that we should put more effort into it, right? So that's one. Bug reports, contributions, and ideas also, right? Totally. So how does it do this, right? Essentially, it does it a bit like uh, government does it, right? Or the EU, for instance, that caters to the lowest common denominator. So essentially, we have this common data format, right? Each of these guys, they have their own different data format that they consume and they return, right? And here, we have this common data format. And using nerds, we have converters that uh, are able to consume this and you know, passing the data to this guy in one way, this guy another way, and this guy another way, and so forth, right? And again, outputs from these are again converted back to this format and sent out. So you have a common API that uh, talks, you know, that as a data scientist you can talk to, and internally it works on these uh, different uh, models. Benefits: it's a consistent API, so all models are subclasses of any other model. So you have four things here: uh, fit is for training. Um, predict is for predicting. Save is to save your model to disk. Load is to retrieve it. So it's very scikit-learn-like, although, as I'll tell you later, it's not exactly scikit-learn um, you know, compatible. So however, one big, um, uh, as a data scientist, one big advantage you will get is that you have to do your data preparation only once, right? And you can reuse it across different models. Um, we have provided some reusable training and evaluation code. Uh, which I'm trying to get rid of uh, and revert more to scikit-learn and use theirs. 
Um, there is a familiar scikit-learn like API, as you can see, fit, predict, and whatnot. And because all of them have the same uh, API, the duck typing, uh, you know, idea of Python, which walks like a duck, you know, it is a duck, right? Um, it allows us to build ensembles out of these things, right? So you can actually call them using the same uh, thing. And the last one is uh, probably something that you know I find very uh, dear to my heart, is that you know if you are actually having domain experts build your NER data for you, they are going to constantly come back and say how much do you need, right? And honestly, you don't know, right? In most cases, it depends on how difficult it is and so forth. And so this gives you a nice idea. You say, you know, you say, okay, give me like a thousand sentences, right? And then you run it and you see what you get. And then if it's not good enough, you either go back and say your, you know, tagging is not right, or you say, give me more data, right? So this actually helps you. You know, you can basically baseline your uh, data really fast. Okay. So, um, so the thing is that you know we talked about our data um, common data format, and that's a really good idea. Uh, but I started looking at it, and uh, I wasn't able to make this guy, right, the, the BioLSTM one, run. And the reason for it is because uh, the old code was written against an older version and of the, the Anago um, uh, BioLSTM thing. There's a third-party tool. And they had changed their API in the meantime. And so when I went in, I still could not make it run. It would give me, like, uh, at the end of five epochs, it will give me some timestamp error. And I worked on it, I tried to fix it, but I couldn't. So ultimately, in frustration, I went back and you know, did it against the third party tool, you know, wrote my code against the third party uh, code itself, taking any out, the nerds out in the process. And it worked. So then I started looking at it, and I realized that, you know, so this was the native format that this guy consumed, right? And then I saw that this one, too, consumed the exact same native format. So two out of four had the same simpler native format, right? So I basically wrote, and these are kind of similar. They took like span-oriented things instead of a list of tokens and a list of tags. They took a list of spans as the, the, the labels. And uh, so I figured that it's fairly easy to write uh, converters for the ones that do not conform to the standard and go forward with that. So that's how I came up with this. Uh, I think it's simpler. But, you know, and so, you know, so this is my new. The forked version uh, basically uses the simpler data format. And, as a result of that, I also got a new um, model for free, right? This one. So while while uh, you know between the time that it was open sourced and the time I started looking at it, the Anago uh, project basically created a new um, this guy, the new Elmo based NER uh, thing, and I basically could hook it up. It was like you know five minute job to just hook it up. So I'm going to just go through the nerd's usage pattern. And uh, for that, I took uh, data from this BioNLP 2004 BioEntity Recognition Task. It has uh, four, uh, five uh, different kinds of entities, uh, and it's all it's all tagged in bio format and in conlil format. So I had about 500,000 uh, training examples and about 100,000 test examples. And um, the entity distribution, as you can see, was for DNA, RNA, cell line, cell type, and protein. And as you can see, it's actually not. Uh, very balanced. It's quite unbalanced, right? Um, although that uh, does not actually um, affect you for the good uh, NERs, but you see it, right? So um, if you look um, at the calling sequence, the calling pattern, it's actually quite simple, right? So essentially, you instantiate it, right? Instantiate your uh, NER model, you train it, and then you can optionally save it and retrieve it, which I did just to test the whole thing. And then you can take your trained model and generate predictions on it, right? So it's like three lines. And then you can uh, generate your classification report. Um, these are some, you know, like uh, kind of uh, adapter functions that I have. But this classification report comes from uh, scikit-learn, right? So, and you can see that, you know, it looks exactly the same. And, uh, so, and you can see it's like about 6, 0.65 from a dictionary NER. So it's not that bad. And incidentally, dictionary NERs are usually the first line of defense because, uh, you know, most uh, companies have uh, ontologies and dictionaries about their domain. And, you know, that's a very useful baseline, uh, even though it's like 1975 technology. Um, so the thing I did here, uh, the improvement that I did was, uh, you know, this, was, this had a different pipeline uh, in the old NERD system. 
I basically converted it to the fit, uh, you know, fit to train, predict to um, predict, right, uh, setup, and also made it handle multiple entity classes. For some reason, that handle only single class. There's no reason the automaton, the Ahokura Sick automaton cannot handle more than one class at a time. So I just made the change. Um, the second one was, uh, again, this was the CRF NER. Okay. So um, the improvement here is that uh, they had a dependency on NLTK, and now, you know, and I was using Spacey anyway, so I just uh, took out NLTK. So I don't have. Uh, the other big uh, improvement here was that uh, the feature, you know, the, the featureization of your tokens was kind of transparent, it was hidden uh, under the, uh, the NER. So I still have that as my default. But if you want to add more features, you can do so in this new system, right? So you can actually pass in features as well. Um, but if you look at the way in which you call it, you will, and if you remember what the dictionary NER had, it's identical, right? There is no difference, except the only difference here is that um, you call a different model. Everything else is the same. And it gives you a slightly better number, 7.7. Seven. Uh, Spacey, um, again, you know, this, um, Spacey NER is actually uh, based on Spacey, and it's uh, not a bi LSTM CRF, it's a neural model, uh, but it's actually a state of the art, very close to state of the art um, according to the documentation. So, again, you know, the uh, calling sequence is identical, uh, very boring now. And the only difference I did was I used mini batches, so this is easier to work with for large data sets. It's kind of, uh, it was an oversight, I'm guessing, where the original code, so I just fixed that. Um, this gives you about 78%, right? And um, finally, we have the CRF NAR. Um, this is, um, again, the only thing I did here was make it work, because it didn't work. Um, calling sequence is the same, and uh, you get like 78%. The ELMO NAR is, um, it needs an additional uh, glove or some kind of static word uh, embedding. Okay, and uh, some kind of static word embedding, and uh, so that's why I have this uh, exist check. Otherwise, again, the calling sequence is the same. Um, and this was the one I got for free, right? And this one gives me about 80% F1. Um, and here is an ensemble uh, example. The only thing here is that I already pre-trained those things, so I loaded them in, and then I call it here in the fit. In, sorry, oh, okay. Um, so in the fit, I basically pass in the estimators I want to ensemble. Um, I could also, so fit is basically for training, right? Oops. So uh, fit is basically for training, um, but I already have pre-trained, so I say is pre-trained true, and I don't pass any of the, um, the parameters for fit in here. So these are empty um, uh, parameters here. And again, um, you do predict here just like you do normally, and you get this kind of results. So I wanted to kind of show you a comparison across um, the different models that we have. If you notice, uh, 0.65, the, I'm getting F1 scores. I have done nothing. I have written three lines of code per uh, model, right? Um, I'm getting F1 scores from 0.65 to 0.8, which are pretty good as a baseline. I have not done any hyperparameter tuning, right? So this can give you a very good baseline to start your work with. And even across entity types, if you notice, this is from the ELMO model, and uh, F1 scores range from 0.61 and 0.81, right? So the idea is that you can, you know, leverage existing functionality and create your custom NERs really, really fast, right? Uh, future work, I have a bit. So like I mentioned, the current API is superficially cyclone-like, so it has issues with uh, serialization when it comes to parallelizing using joblib parallel. So um, essentially, it means that I cannot train them in parallel, Right? because it will not serialize correctly. Um, it's not a big deal because most of the time you would actually train it earlier and then just use it for prediction, uh, for uh, ensembling. Also, uh, if I can make it uh, scikit-learn compatible, I can basically just use, I can eliminate my ensemble NER and use the scikit-learn voting classifier instead, right? And also I can leverage the randomized search and the grid search uh, meta estimators from um, uh, scikit-learn. So those are, that's one big structural change I want to make um, in the future. Uh, I also want to add flare and bird-based NER. I mentioned the coming soon. That's the bird-based NER is the coming soon. And there is the other one, which is BRAT. BRAT is a manual uh, you know, used by domain experts to hand annotate documents. And that uh, creates an XML uh, output. 
So essentially, I want to you know be able to directly adapt and copy you know get it into my own format and uh, use my models. So these are my annotation. Uh, that's the feature work I have, and this is all I had. Um, so that uh, QR code, you can actually, um, it, you can actually, uh, if you want to go to the GitHub page, you can go um, type this in, or you could point your camera at this QR code, and that will take you there. Uh, in the README, there is a link to the um, the slides. So um, you know, so that's that's pretty much all I have. Um, I'm open to questions. If you cannot handle questions uh, within the time frame, we can you can either catch me outside or you can email me. And yeah, so I'm done. Thank you. Uh, it actually uh, the it ended up getting the best scores for. So in my case, uh, I um, did the ensemble out of the four things I have, not the Elmo one, because Elmo takes a lot of time. Um, so the scores I got were actually the best in each category, almost, right? So it didn't boost it in the sense that, uh, you know, okay, overall it boosted it, but it didn't boost it on the individual, um, you know. I got like 78 F1 score overall, which was the same as what I got with Spacey and uh, the BioLSTM. Do you consider 80% F1? As a, yeah, F1, or yeah, to be a state of the art these days, pretty close to it? Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I, I would want to go higher, though, before it is usable. What's the highest you've ever gotten? Uh, with NERs, uh, I've got about 87 ish, but I would really like to go to about 90 ish, 90 plus. Uh, two questions. First is, do you have a reference for that protein uh, paper you show, the results? Uh, I, this is not a paper. This is, oh. um, I basically took it from here. I can, I don't have a, I might have it, but I don't have it on me here. Okay. Uh, where is this? Ah, here. So this is the BioNLP 2004 uh, task. And oh, I, I see, think I, see. I might have it. Give me a second. I, it might, I might have it. Uh, the second question is, I will just ask when you're mm -hmm. looking for it. Yeah. Um, Elmo is a character-based embedding, right? Um, Elmo is not no. character-based. Um, um, is it from, is it from Alan? Uh, yes. Alan? yes. Uh, I think it's contextual, but in the training, it's like it broken into character-based? It's uh, broken into subwords. Oh, so, okay. So uh, it has its tokenizer, but uh, if you say, so in my example, right, 44th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, it will actually break it up into 44 and th, mm -hmm. right? So that that part, yes, it breaks it up into subwords, but not uh, consistently like uh, fast text does. Fast text breaks it up uh, regardless of uh, inflection. It breaks it up into three character trigrams, oh. and you know uses that. So each word is basically the sum of the embeddings for the three character trigrams. Mm, I see. Thank you. But this one is more um, inflection based, so it's the Google's uh, tokenizer. So if you go to the website, the GitHub, and you go under examples and bio NLP, it has the link to that. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. Who, I guess it's a volume and level of effort of annotating for your, your training set. I mean, obviously, you have some training sets already done, but if I was starting from scratch, what's sort of the, the level of effort and amount of documents? I mean, it depends a lot, I'm sure. but. Yeah, usually, uh, typically, like I mentioned here, I, you know, this is my ballpark kind of thing. I usually say, give me like a thousand sentences, and I start from there. <laughs> and it could go up to like 5,000, 6,000 sentences. And how much effort does that take? You think, how much effort? Like, if you had to do that now for a new entity, how would you go about doing it? How long would it take? Um, so, um, typically, we, um, you know, we have like teams of three or four domain experts at a time. And uh, they would, uh, you know, you give them um, about week, week and a half is about uh, per, per batch of uh, questions. Okay, yeah. Uh, let's thank Sujit sure. uh, for some talk. <laughs>